you to be careful and take precautions to reduce the risk of infection. As you can see, we have hit the ground running this year, uh, bringing you an exceptional lineup of leading renewable energy developers here in South Africa. They will be sharing with you the fundamentals of renewable energy project development, and you will be given an overview of project development requirements across both solar PV and wind technology projects. Site identification and land acquisition is the first step to developing a good project. Uh, we have also received many queries on this topic particularly, and will therefore spend some time uh, getting into the details on this topic. Assessing the energy resources is key to a feasible and profitable project, and our technical experts are on hand to talk to you about both wind and solar PV separately. We will also hear from WKN Wind Current, a renewable energy project developer. They will be sharing information on their footprint in South Africa and the opportunities within the renewable energy project development space. I will thereafter conclude by handing over to my co-host, Ms. Ntomi Fortin Tuli, to facilitate a Q&A session and wrap up today's webinar. But before we start, I do need to pay the bills. So this series of webinars are in partnership with the IPP office, BEPA, the Black Energy Professionals Association, and REFSA, the Renewable Energy Entrepreneurs Forum of South Africa. And the, the series of webinars has been sponsored by Mainstream Renewable Power and Juvi Renewable Energies. Today's session particularly is sponsored by WKN Wind Current. I would now like to welcome you all to sit back and enjoy the esteemed panel of speakers I encourage you all to participate by way of questions. Please provide your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, and these will be addressed at the end of the session uh, during the facilitated Q&A session. If the speakers don't mind, uh, in the essence of time, I'm going to skip over the speaker bios. Uh, the speaker bios can be found on the slides when we are introducing the speaker. They have been sent out on the, in, uh, on the invitation and they are available upon request. If you have a job opening for any of the speakers, I'm happy to send you their CVs as well. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over and welcome Ms. Chanda Kumalo, uh, who is the director of Hamilton Renewables. Uh, she will be speaking on the development of solar PV projects. Thanks, Nivesh. Um... Kim, I think you can skip it. I don't need to look at my face. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Happy New Year um, and welcome to the webinar. Um, hopefully we'll address some of your questions and feel free to put them in the Q&A and we'll try and answer them. Maybe just to contradict one thing Navesh said, I think everybody else on here is from a uh, approaching this from a development point of view. I'm a, one of the dreaded consultants, so I'm <laughs> Harmatan is a technical consultancy. So I've kind of approached this from a slightly different point of view um, in that it's looking at what we see when we are doing due diligence on projects, either for lenders or for um, people acqu or companies acquiring projects. Um, and so how you ought to structure your, um, your project in order to get it to fruition. Um, so I'll do a very brief introduction to Harmatan. Kim, you can just skip to the next slide, thanks. So um, Harmatan Renewables, as I said, is a technical consultancy. We work across the uh, life cycle of renewables, right from early stage feasibility um, studies, energy yield assessments, through the construction, due diligence, and operations of projects. Um, and our, some of our goals are basically enhancing the performance, improving efficiency, and minimizing risk on projects. Um, you can go to the next slide, Kim. I won't go into this too much, but um, we're a black women owned company um, that has been operating in South Africa for since 2012. Um, and as I said, we cover the life cycle. So this will all be in the slides when you get them. You can jump up to the next slide, Kim. Okay, um, so project development. Um, project development really is like a giant jigsaw puzzle and you're trying to get all of the pieces to fit. And sometimes uh, you have some pieces and then other pieces are missing and you're searching for them. So what I've tried to do in this presentation is to um, 
give you a framework for how you need to consider project development. And the one that I found most useful um, is one that's been developed by uh, NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratories in the US. Um, and so you'll see in the slide, um, they have a definition of what project development ought to cover, which is site, resource, offtake, permits, technology, team, and capital. And so we'll go through each of those and discuss them. Um, but I've also put in here, um, and this is from an IFC document, which for those of you who are wanting to get into solar um, project development is very useful. They've done a very comprehensive um, document looking specifically at solar PV project development. And these are the different stages um, as, as they define them, starting from site identification through pre-feasibility and feasibility, and then um, through to getting finance and detailed design. Um, so Kim, you can jump to the next slide. So I've kind of reordered it because as I said, I am looking at this from the point of view of how you need to project, uh, no, back one, please. Uh, yeah, how you need to package your project with the end in mind, because ultimately as a developer, you'll need to get your project financed. Um, and so the lenders are the uh, last, the last hurdle once you've developed a project. And so you need to consider how they are going to assess the project and basically prepare your project from the beginning for due diligence, which means uh, you need to go, you need to ensure that all of the, uh, the paperwork is in place, all of the documents have been um, collated properly, that the development is done to international standards as far as possible. This is because getting project finance on your develop your your project is a bit like getting a mortgage on your house so they the security for the lenders on your project is um, on the loan is your project so they want to minimize the risk as far as possible because all of their cash flows and them getting paid back is based on how your project is set up what the risks are what the inputs are and how much energy it's going to produce to allow you to sell it so you're going to set up the project under a special purpose vehicle and ideally, and again, I'm saying this because, so for those of you who, <laughs> who know these things and wouldn't make these silly mistakes, forgive me, but we've seen this a lot of times is that, you know, you go, you develop the project under a personal name or you develop it um, under your own personal company and then you have to go through a whole process of transferring contracts, etc. So ideally set up the project under a special purpose vehicle, which is a dedicated vehicle for the project under development um, and this project will then be funded by equity and then eventually through debt the equity initially is you as the project developer what the money that you're putting towards it um, often sweat equity so the work that you're doing and um, for the project and then you will later bring in other equity providers and then debt be that the commercial banks or the uh, multilateral international banks so ideally um, and you'll see in that sentence below you need to undertake studies as early as possible um, just to minimize the risk and prepare your project for due diligence, either by an incoming equity provider or by the, the debt providers. So as I said, we're framing um, everything going forward on this basis. So Kim, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is just a quick one on the, the project costs and how those ramp up. And as you'll see uh, why I'm using that capital back one, <laughs> the capital as the main focus is that the, the, the majority of the investment occurs basically at financial close or over construction and it's the lenders that take that. So you as a developer have um, smaller spend um, upfront and then we go through to the construction. Um, okay, you can jump to the next one. So going back to our framework that we were looking at, um, the first thing that you need in order to have a solar project is a site. Um, Back, back. <laughs> um, the, so the site here, most of what I'm going to talk about during this is more focused on utility scale projects. However, applies also for rooftop projects and for commercial and industrial projects, so embedded generation projects. Um, you will always need to have a site on which to put your equipment and your project. So here's a few options of the kinds of sites that you might be looking at. So a greenfield site, um, think a field and an agricultural land or land that hasn't been used before, building integrated projects, um, ground mounted projects that are on um, commercial industrial parking lots. Um, so you have seen, you know, macro for example, have the solar projects in their um, carports um, and then brownfield sites, which we're discussing a bit more in South Africa at the minute. So looking at 
old mines or landfill sites and rehabilitating those. Okay, next one, Kim. So once you've selected what type of project you're doing, um, then you need to understand your site. And there's quite a few bits of that jigsaw puzzle um, that we were talking about that you need to understand. So is there land available? Um, what is the land used for? Um, zoning in particular, and I won't go into too much detail on the land because um, our, my colleagues are gonna speak um, more about that later. But what is the land used for? Does it need to be rezoned? If it's high performing agricultural land, then do you want to um, then utilize that for a solar PV project or can it have more functional uses? Um, what are the ground conditions um, off the site? So this will feed into your designs later on for looking at um, your foundations and whether you need to do detailed geotech studies on the, on the site. If there's wetlands and water bodies around, all of these fit, feed into your permitting and what the climate on the site is and how that will affect both your design, but also your, um, your energy resource access, you need to be able to get to the site. Um, and what people often forget is you don't just need to be able to get to the site when you construct it, you also need to be able to get to the site during operations. So make sure that that um, is available through the life of the project. Um, environmental situation, so you will have to do, unless it's a, um, a smaller project that you can do a basic assessment, you'll have to go through a full environmental impact assessment on the site. Is there a grid connection? I mean, you need to be able to sell your power in order, and we'll come back to that later. Um, therefore, you need to be able to connect to a grid um, and how that, the cost, the capacity that's available on that um, are all important factors to consider in selecting your site. Um, I put in here the link for the strategic um, environmental assessment, the red zones that are um, exist in South Africa. So. You know, if you put a project in one of those, then you can slightly speed up the process um, in terms of environmental assessments. What flora and fauna and wildlife are on the site, um, which will impact where you can put um, equipment and how you design it. Archaeology, are there any um, areas of heritage? Is there water? And also what's the competition around? So you'll see in the picture on the left, um, a generic map. So the, the land we're saying is suitable in the green, and there happens to be two towns nearby, a river and a road. Um, okay, you can go to the next one. Um, and in your design, you're going to have to um, put your site a certain distance from each of these um, because too close back, <laughs> uh, too close to a too close to a road um, to, or too close to a river, you're going to have issues. So we mark off the boundaries or the buffers um, around each of these. And then we have the remainder of the, the land in green um, that's still available. Um, and this is done, you can go to the next slide. Um, as a project developer, um, I said it's like a jigsaw puzzle, but the thing about development is it's also iterative. So you don't just suddenly, still, we're still on the one before, please. Um, you don't, you're not just going to suddenly pick a site. You go through different processes and look at the different um, criteria. So on the left here, um, we said we, oh, we had the list of, um, of things that we need to understand about our site, but you can look at that on a countrywide basis on your, from the GIS. So the grid network, the REDS, the EIA app applications um, and the competition, and then put all of those together and um, find where the available areas are uh, that are most competitive. Um, so you can go to the next one. So once you, you've done all of that and gone through your various iterations, you're left with a suitable area, which here is uh, marked out in the box in yellow. Um, and this essentially is to get you to what the available capacity is that you can build or the number of megawatts that you can build. And again, we go back to that capital. So you're doing all of this to understand what the return on investment could be. So you need to know the size of the project um, and therefore how much you could expect in terms of revenue based on the different costs that you, um, you could have for the project. So you, once you've got that area, then you can do a preliminary high level design to understand how many megawatts you could fit into that site and whether it's viable and in your iterative process to, keep, to go ahead. Okay, Kim, next one. Um, so the next one on our framework is the resource. And again, I, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because you'll have a bit more detail. No, I'm still on it. <laughs> uh, have we, Kim? I think we can't Sorry, see. I apologize for that, Chanda. I think there's a technical difficulty with the slides. We're just changing over uh, 
So Marilise okay. can take over this one. Okay, I'll just talk about the resource one while you're doing that one. So the resource um, one, I don't propose to go into too much detail about, but essentially you need to understand um, what, um, how much energy you can produce from your site and the inputs to that, um, if you could you put it on the full slide, uh, the, on slide 17, please. Next one. Yes, perfect. And um, so you need to understand what the resource is on your site. Um, and depending on what stage you are at in the development, this back one, please. Um, what stage you're at in the development, uh, there's different levels of detail and certainty that you need surrounding the resource. Um, so you go from the uh, resource to uh, what your energy yield is going to be in the project, and that will then feed back into your revenue estimates. Um, but as I said, my colleagues are going to go into much more detail about how to do a full energy resource assessment, so I won't um, go into that this year. Um, Kate, you can jump to the next one. Um, the next area on our framework is the offtake. Um, so in South Africa, we have the we have the REIPP um, process, which allows um, under a, a tender setup for you to sell power directly to ESCOM. Um, but essentially what the bank will look for when they're funding your project is a power purchase agreement of some sort or the ability to sell power to an entity. And again, remember all of this comes down to your project being bankable. So um, under the offtake, you need the agreement um, with what, whoever that entity is, ideally they need to be a credit worthy off taker. So the bank will look at whether they're going to be able to pay you for that power over the life of the project. How long um, are you selling power to them for? Ideally for as long as, um, as you have put in your financial model, ideally 20 years. And if they're smaller projects, it'll be, it'll be less. Um, how are you going to pay the bank back? So what is your tariff um, and your tariff should allow you to earn more than the costs of operating and running the project? Um, do you need to wheel? Um, so wheeling is slightly controversial in South Africa at the minute, but something that I believe is, is moving forward and, and coming. So um, are you going to sell from one, a project to a, a purchaser in a different location? Um, and net metering, which is something that we have in um, different areas of the world, but um, is not such a, a big thing here in South Africa, but ensuring that you have an offtake um, agreement signed up before you get to close, to financial close. Okay, next one. Okay, then the next one on our, um, our framework is the permits. Um, and it seems obvious to say, but oops, back. Yeah, they, they need to be in place. Um, often you will have a project that um, there are applications in place for, or not all the permitting has been completed. Um, and really this is, uh, is a, a checking the box exercise because the lenders will want to see this. Um, you need to meet the requirements, the lo local requirements, so all of the South African requirements. And if you're getting funding from a multilateral or a, a development finance institution, you will likely need to meet the equator principles and IFC standards requirements. Um, I've put a list on the, on the left-hand side here. This covers both solar and then some of them are more wind um, focused a list of the of the permits um, that you need to to go through and it, this is a, an exercise in project management really and what is part of the skill of being a developer is ensuring that you can get these permits in place um, and just ensuring that they're in place for everything that you need so again what we see often is people will um, permit the uh, the module the panels and the, the footprint of the panels but forget that they need to run cables from one point to another or that the access roads have not um, been um, approved or the grid connection so you have to ensure that every part of your project um, is covered within the permits okay. uh, can we go to the next one um, leases, again, I think Marcia is going to go into this in a lot more detail, um, but what you, we, we would look at into, um, on behalf of the lenders is, is the length of the lease and make sure that it covers you for the whole life of the project and what are the areas that are covered um, and what rights are granted to you as the developer. So where can you build? Can you have borrow pits? Um, what do you owe to the landowner in terms of their rights and uh, what are they allowed to do on the land? Um, and then 
again, one that seems silly, but is it signed? <laughs> and so uh, this is something that we, again, often see that um, you have a document, but it hasn't actually been, um, been ratified. Um, we can jump to the next one. I won't go into detail on that. Uh, and then we look at the technology and the design. So you've got your, the area that you want to build your project on. Uh, yeah, that one, thank you. Um, that you want to build your project on. And in order to get the size of the project, you need to do an outline system design. So again, iterative process, look at the various design configurations and try to optimize them for your site. So your goal in all of this is to maximize the possible revenue and minimize the, the risks under the project. So you're trying to um, optimize the design so that um, your project is essentially going to be able to deliver as much power as practically possible with the site that you have. Um, looking at shading um, requirements on the site, looking at O&M requirements. And again, this is something that often developers forget is that you're going to develop the project, then it has to be built and then it has to be built for 20 years. So take those, um, things into consideration. Is there enough spacing for you to um, fit a vehicle in between the rows so that you can clean panels? Um, how are you going to get a lawnmower in between or a rad on lawnmower in between so that you can cut grass, et cetera, et cetera. So taking all of these things into consideration upfront just means that your project is more likely to run as you have predicted it will over the life of the project. Um, then, um, so one outline system design next stage is then detailed site plan. So remember at the beginning, we said do studies as early as possible. Um, and so often as a developer, we look to minimize the costs up front, and this can end up costing more later in the life of the project. So there is a balance to be struck, um, but the more detail that you can get and the more levels of certainty on what ground types there are, the contours and the topography of the site and where, uh, whether there are floodplains, and the requirements for um, your balance of plant contractor in terms of civil works and your electrical works, that that will cost you less later on in the life of the project. Um, next. And um, then just a second quick one in terms of technology. So you've done your design, but there's also various options in terms of, <laughs> in terms of um, the technology that you can select. So again, it comes down to bankability. So um, if we look, there's three there that we, you know, the, the module selection, the inverter selection, the type of mounting frame and tracker. So under the modules, there's different op options that you can look at. Um, monofacials, bifacials are getting, um, more traction in the South African market at the minute. From lenders' point of view, often they want to know that something has either track record or proven certification. Um, so it's important that you take all of these things into consideration when you're choosing your modules. Um, there's a, a balance, again, to be struck between track record, local content, who your suppliers are, the warranties of those modules as well, um, and what they will give you, and then the financial standing of the company that you're buying from. Similar applies to, um, to your selection of inverters. Um, you can jump to the next one, which is then just looking at the different types of mounting that you can, um, can have. Um, most frequently in South Africa, we see the um, single axis tracker, although there are fixed tilt um, systems. Um, it's okay, you can jump to the next one. Um, and then finally is the team that you assemble um, to develop the project. So everybody cannot do everything. Um, so I and again, in the interest of a balance of uh, expenditure versus, um, yeah, if expenditure versus risk, try and surround yourself with people that understand project development, have taken projects through the process, have taken projects through financial close. They don't have to be employed by you full time. Um, you can you know, bring people in for specific areas that you, um, that you need, so specific specializations at different points, um, but just try to ensure that you, uh, that you have a, a team with a track record. Again, lenders like to see that experience um, in a team if they are uh, lending to them, equity investors as well, that they're uh, investing in an experienced team with knowledge that can ensure that the project uh, gets to completion. So that is a whirlwind tour through PV project development. Thank you. Um, I'm sure 
uh, and somebody will have questions later on for me. Thank you very much, Chanda. Um, I apologize for the technical glitches on the presentation. My team has been looking as to what went wrong and we see that a timer has sneaked into the slide presentation. So they've now removed that uh, and hopefully it will be probably a my more fault, to be <laughs> Thank you for that. So uh, thank you, Chanda. I think you've covered for us the key steps in project development. Um, and you've also provided a number of tips on how to handle particular challenges or hurdles that come up when you're trying to uh, develop a project. I think what's very interesting for me is that you've touched on understanding the RFP of the Renewable Energy IPP procurement program. You've talked about the financial uh, perspective, uh, the financial requirements, the financiers requirements and the lenders requirements quite a bit, uh, and also the legal perspective in terms of the legal requirements. And these are all sessions that we had uh, as part of this uh, series of webinars that covered those uh, in detail. And I see it also creeps back into project development uh, so it's good for those of you who are following the series that they will all start to make sense and fit together uh, when you're trying to put your development team together to make these projects work. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jakobus Trirnik. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> it's uh, Trirnik. There you go. Uh, and you're going to be talking to us about developing wind energy projects. So over yes, that is correct. Thank you very much, Nivishan, um, and all of the people attending, the participants. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. I think we can uh, skip past this little intro of myself and um, just going to jump right into where Chanda has now very, 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 very well explained how renewable energy development for solar works. I'm going to focus on developing wind energy projects. First, I'm just going to have a quick little brief introduction. Um, I'm from G7 Energies. Next slide, please. So yeah, G7 Renewable Energies. Uh, we are active wind energy developer. Previous slide, please. Uh, active renewable energy developers specifically initially focused on wind. So um, that is how we made our name. And my section of, of the development process is definitely looking into land rights and the economic development uh, of the company. Economic development, very specifically something that you have to look in later in the process. Um, I'm actually a town, town and regional planner, which just comes to show that anybody can, anyone can really enter this market and there's opportunities for everybody. And I've been involved since 2012, when we really started seeing how, how the development has um, on a policy basis been implemented in South Africa. And when we really started seeing land use changes happening, uh, especially in terms of solar. So yeah, next slide. Enough about myself. I'm going to, unlike um, Chanda, which has gone into a lot of detail and definitely have a more technical perspective, um, I think I'm going to focus more later on in the presentation on the opportunities and challenges that we that we see in the wind development industry. But in terms of your development requirements, I'm going to try and keep it really short and sweet and just focus on the fundamentals. And what I cannot stress enough is that the base data that you have um, at your disposal to start your development process, to do your pre-feasibility studies, to start looking for, for investment opportunities is of critical importance. And I break that down into three components. First and foremost is, um, that land is important. And in South Africa, land is broken up into cadastral properties. So having the cadastral data of South Africa at your disposal, which links to the deeds registry in the country and which will direct you to any landowner in the country is of critical importance. Then of course, I'm just gonna switch those two around. What is important is having data about your wind resources. Now, my colleague Inga is gonna discuss more about the wind resources, but obviously when you want to develop, you <laughs> you want to go to where the highest potential wind energy resource is in the country. Now, we have various atlases that gives you access to that. Um, there's wind simulators which combine the wind resource data that you collect over time as your pre-feasibility through meteorological masts and also interpolate that with uh, topography, which gives you hotspot in a country where to focus. Now you've got the wind. Now you've got that as a resource. You know you want to put up your wind towers, your turbines, uh, but where are you going to go with all that electricity that's being generated? And um, hot topic, of course, ESCOM and South Africa's grid infrastructure. So 
where do we have grid connection points? There's no use in developing a renewable energy project or a wind project specifically 50 kilometers away from a grid connection point, or you, as we commonly say, substations, and there's no capacity because you're gonna see losses and there's gonna be no way for you to evacuate the power. Um, Chanda, if you would excuse me that I constantly refer back to you, but she has so delicately placed where you have the different layers of GIS data. So you can basically, it's basically cutting out the areas and that cadastral grid and wind resources, those three sections is a critical component of that. Right, now you know your, where your wind is, now you know where you want to develop. Now you're gonna need land. Land is basically the basis um, of all renewable energy development. Now, our colleague Moesha Grimbeek, Moesha, sorry for that mispronunciation, is going to focus on that in more detail. But I do, since my title is Land Right Manager, just want to touch on, on five points. I think what we always need to understand in South Africa is that land is a sentimental thing. It's a sentimental thing to the owners. Uh, people hold the value of land. We see it in our politics. We see it in our policy. And therefore, it is also an expensive component. People want something in return for it. And that's important. Nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, you want to see that kind of, you'd want to see that being respected in your process. And you want to see that also coming to the foreground where people are adequately compensated. So I think it's also there that we must focus, especially when we look at sentiments that you are, when you are identifying land and when you are acquiring land and going to these landowners to get from them the security of tenure, that you focus on them as people. Uh, these are people that you need to build a relationship with. These are people, the development process is not a short thing. It's not a quick in and a quick out. It's going to be a relationship that's probably going to last you well into 30 years. Sometimes development takes up to 10 years. I will go to that in terms of how you need patience. And then obviously your power purchase agreement, which is where you do your sale of electricity, lasts 20 years. That's a long time. So you best start off that relationship on the right foot. So security of tenure, once again, back to financing, no investor and no uh, financing company is going to give you, you go ahead to go ahead with these projects, but if you don't have security of tenure, um, Chandra pointed out, make sure that contract is signed. There's so many times where we see people or, or that you have all the documents. You go, you see people sign the contract and when it comes to registration, they turn around and say, oh, you know, I don't really want to give you this, you know, the registration documents. And then that's a whole different legal battle that you don't want to get into. The question of costs, I raised that earlier. I'm just saying it again. People want money in exchange for their land. Now, here's the big problem is the fact that renewable energy development projects often only generate most of their income later. And it's a very difficult balancing act to make sure that all of these things balance out onto one another. Right. And then last but not least, um, connection to the grid. I'm saying it's buying beyond boundaries. We often forget that you're not always in the lucky position that your project is developed right next to uh, grid connection point. So what you want to see at the end of the day is that where those people between your project and the grid connection point and needs to have a power line built over their property, you need to understand that that relationship and their land is also something that you need access to. Right, next. More development requirements. Uh, now that was a little bit more, little bit more technical. Well, not even remotely technical, but it was a little bit more paper orientated. Whereas here, I want to touch on the softer issues: human resources. Developing a renewable energy plant, developing a wind farm, is not a one-man show. You're going to need engineers. You're going to need planners. You're going to need lawyers. You're going to have to have all of these people on your team. And at the end of the day, what you want is people that's well-versed or that can give you the right advice. They don't need to be part of your team on a permanent basis, but you need access to that resource. It's of critical importance. Next to that, I want to put patience. Um, it's not something I'm always great at. But the thing about patience is, as I said earlier, you don't have a quick fix in this development. You start a process, you take it from pre-feasibility, then you take it through all of the hassles, you take it through the permitting process, and then you wait for the bidding rounds, the government bidding rounds, then there's politics at play. The development process becomes expansive and time, and you need to be able to stay there for a very long time. 
And with that patience then also comes the question of financial resilience. Can you maintain that time? Do you have the financial backing? Does your investors understand that this isn't going to be a quick in and out? Do they understand the length of the process? And will but they be able to continue to back you for that time? That brings you to the next point, like the tenacity. <laughs> you need to be tenacious like a honey badger because if you're going to give up, you're not going to make this happen. If you're going to give up, you're going to fail. Uh, you need to be able to stick it out and make this work. And therefore, you must have commitment to the cause and truly believe in renewable energy industry. I, I don't think it's a place for a developer to come in and to say, you know, this looks like it's the big new uh, boom industry. We're just going to get in here and get out. Um, renewable energy, I think, is a lifestyle. And it's also a commitment that you make uh, not only to the cause of energy security, but also uh, to the planet in itself. Next slide. Right, permitting. OK, now I'm going to get into the really boring stuff. I'm just going to quickly touch on the main things that you need for a wind farm. I put that big red door there because we all know the red tape of bureaucracy. This is your access point to the process. Most importantly, the following you need in hand. National Environmental Management Act approval. We call it environmental authorization. This is a lengthy process. It can take anything from two years to four years. Sometimes you get more than one appeal on it. It stretches on to five years that you need that. And you best understand that you will not be able, in most cases, um, to bid without environmental authorization in place. So this is one of the items that has the longest lead times. I'm gonna follow this slide with more detail as to all the studies that forms part of the environmental assessment that you do. Uh, but I just need you to focus that when you're looking at your team, that you also make sure that you have environmental specialists and access to environmental specialists. Now there's many of them in South Africans. It's also a very strongly woman empowered industry in our country. And I'll get back to that later. I uh, also just wanna say, and Tommy specifically asked me to look at costs. Now this permitting is where the most of your cost is going to be uh, initially to get to the point of having a bid ready development. Now, uh, national environmental uh, impact assessments can take almost half a million to a million rand to work with. So that's a lot of capital input that you have to make. Then uh, it was touched on the rezoning. That's where you look at the Spatial Planning and Land Use Management Act, SPLUMA. Uh, now, SPLUMA is a relatively new legislation. We, have to ha we used to have different uh, legislations for different provinces, but now we have a nationalized legislation. This is where you direct the land use as the name states. Can you farm or can you build an industry or can you build a business on a certain property? And what we had to do in terms of wind energy, because we are so strongly uh, rooted in the course that we can have both wind farms and agriculture on the same property without the negative displacement of the two, uh, we had to get creative in terms of that policy as well. On top of that, if you're going to use only lease a section of land, you have to have the subdivision of agricultural land act approval in your hand. It's Act 70 of 1970. We call it SALA. Uh, as a developer, you will hear that name time and time again. And then we have the CAA, Civil Aviation Act, because you're building massive towers with massive blades uh, that can reach the heights of 205 meters and even higher. And it's we just continue to grow. You don't want aeroplanes to fly into that. Um, and, and, and something that I found quite interesting that I never thought of until I got into the industry was proximity to radar stations. Across South Africa, we have what we call ATNS radars. They um, basically do the navigation for planes on your main flight routes. There's a big ones on the escarpment. You see them across the country. And if you put uh, turbines too close to that, it's going to get confused and it's going to tell that Boeing to fly into the ground instead of taking you to Joburg. So these are the kind of things that you need to consider. These are the kinds of things you need to stay away from. And then when all of that is in place and you get closer to the point where you're actually going to develop, then you need a cost estimate letter from ESCOM to say, Hey guys, we know that you don't have the money necessarily to build this connection infrastructure, but what is it going to cost us as the private sector to build it for you and then transfer it over? Next slide, please. 
more permitting. <laughs> I won't go into so much detail with this one. I just want to touch on all the things that you need to consider when you are doing your national environmental impact assessments. Quickly running through it, you have to look at your agricultural potential of the land, birds and bats, ecology, water use. Now, birds and bats, very controversial point in wind farm development. Uh, you have nesting grounds of certain bird species. You have bats and their flight paths. And there is the issue that there's a conflict here. And so you need to do detailed studies. You have to do detailed bird and bat monitoring to make sure that when you place your turbines, that you mitigate the risks that these turbines might hold to the avifaunal ecology in the area. Uh, water use is not such a big issue. Geotechnical, what you often find is that you're building a massive structure. So you need to have the proper foundations for it. Traffic impact during your construction phase, it's a big hassle, lots of dust generated, neighbors are unhappy, farmers are unhappy because they can't drive their roads or the droves are just, you know, destroyed in the process and you have to mitigate all of that. Noise impact, I don't know how many of you participating here has stand, stand close to a turning turbine, but it does have a noise implication. Personally, I think it's soothing and beautiful, but of course I'm biased. So there's a visual impact, it's a massive high structure. There's a socioeconomic impact. Are we going to create jobs? What are the positive impacts? What are the negative impacts? You have to look at the heritage and cultural landscape. We're not going to place turbines on top of Table Mountain, for instance. Uh, archaeology. Are there anything that needs to protect it? Paleontology. And then also electromagnetic interference. We have telecommunications. We have satellite communications. We have telecom. We have Syntec. We have Vodacom. You have the military radios. And all of these signals get deflected if there's a turbine in the path. So we need to consider all of them in our development. Next slide, please. Nice. Now I'm at the softer issues, which I like the most. Wind power, wind energy development has a massive amount of opportunities that it can bring to South Africa. I think some of the highlights for me is how women empowerment is a big thing in renewable energy sector as a whole and also in wind uh, there's a big drive for initiatives like the global wind energy council that drives women in wind energy in south africa and i think that is really something that we need to focus on we are innovative industry we are definitely an industry that's growing and pulling a lot of interest and therefore we must take this opportunity to address the matter of empowerment of women now that's fresh coming for me because here i'm sitting i'm a guy <laughs> but definitely if you look at larger companies you will see that there's a lot of female important role players in leaders of position industry and i think it's something that we must positively continue to support then a name or a word or a term that's on everybody's lips is the just transition if we are going to see shifts at the end of the day where we have a shifting power generation from the coal fields, power generation from fossil fuels into a new and developing industry, we need to understand that we there must be an uptake. There must be an uptake of job opportunities for people uh, where there's a disruption. We need to use this as an opportunity to educate people in new technologies and to stay at the forefront of technology in South Africa and not get left behind. So that's one of the opportunities that we capture in the just transition. Of course, it's a topic with a lot of detail and there's extensive debates around it, but I'm not an expert in the field and I just thought, let's just look at it as something that to touch base on. Obviously, I said energy security innovation. We are in the middle of load shedding again. We have energy systems under pressure. And with the innovative application of renewable energy, wind power, solar power, a combination of them, hybrid technologies, this is definitely opportunity that we must grab. Environmental protection. This boils down to the fact that there's definitely a much, much, much less negative impact uh, in terms of large scale environmental destruction brought about by renewable energy. And I know it's up for debate. I am aware of the fact that there's, there's a lot of arguments against it. But just if you look at CO2 pollution, this is definitely the way to go. Then, this is something very important and it comes back into the trust transition economic development drivers. Now, when you do a renewable energy project or a wind project specifically in the REAP program or the RMI PPPP program, there's a lot of things you need to consider in terms of economic development. 
And the important things that they want from you and they basically force you to look into is how is your project over the course of its 20 year lifetime, the revenues generated by it, how is it gonna make um, contribute to education and skills? It, you, you have to apply your mind as to how in the industry you can grow education, how you can send more people to university or other learnership programs. And it does not necessarily have to happen only in the town where your project happens. I saw something about the delineation of the rates and the impact on that. Um, the location of the project does not necessarily have to be the specific place where investment takes place. It can take place broader. It's considered on a local level, a provincial level, and a national level. We look at empowerment. We look at the empowerment of youth. You look at employing more people that's in the youth category, employing more people that's Black, Black women, people with disabilities. Very important stuff. And then one of my favorites, is local content because this is once again where we have a new energy energy industry developing in a country that requires new equipment it requires new manufacturing plant and if we can maintain those manufacturing or basically stimulate that in south africa that is where you're going to see job creation that is where you're going to see growth and that is where you're going to see sustainability right boils down to job creation. As I said, uh, it's not only physically working on the energy plant, on the wind farm that creates jobs, but it's also in terms of creating jobs in manufacturing and the spin of jobs that grow from it. Then a nice one, uh, which I quite enjoy paying attention to is enterprise development. So enterprise development is where you say, okay, besides looking at my own supply chain, where I'm going to develop wind farms and who's going to provide equipment and services to the wind farm itself. Let's look at other small startups that qualify. People, uh, startups with 51% black ownership and up. Startups with 100% women ownership. You look at these, these criteria and these development drivers, you look at these categories and you say, okay, some of my revenue on an annual basis for the life of the project, I will invest on that. Those are the opportunities and those are the positives that we must focus on. Then I want to move on to the challenges. On the next slide, yes. One of the biggest things that stands in the way of development of renewables and the continued development of is policy uncertainty. It is very difficult to basically tell investors to hold on for 10 years if they thought this is going to be a five-year process. If you say to an investor that I want to develop in the reprogram and then the reprogram's bidding windows get delayed, you start getting a problem and that is where you see divestment. Investors, banks, and even all of us participants here that want to develop, before you jump into the industry, you want to have certain certainties. And that is why it's very important that we look at how policy speaks to the continued and sustained development of renewable energy development and the uptake of its electricity in the grid. Just as much as the just transition is an opportunity, it is also a challenging factor because it is very difficult to take people from one industry and to absorb them fully into another. It's not that clear cut. Uh, wind energy and solar energy resources isn't necessarily uniform across the country. So all of that integration brings a challenge into committing to the just transition. And it takes a very, 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 very much creative thought and policy to see how to make the best of that. Then you have prohibitive requirements. I mean, just that whole list of permitting that I just went through should be sufficient enough to tell you about the prohibitions, but also, you know, certain, certain things that make it difficult for certain developments to enter. The proximity of um, substations, the capacity of the grid, the fact that to upgrade the grid, you need to pay for it yourself. That's difficult. Environmental trade-offs. I'm going to take a step back and I say, okay, we're looking at the fact that renewable energy development and wind farms don't have CO2 emissions as large as fossil fuels. But on the other hand, there's an issue with bird flight paths and bat flight paths. Um, in my free time, I also lecture at Cape Tech and I do environmental management there. And one of the things that I always open my lectures with is unfortunately there can be no development without an environmental footprint. It's just a question of how we manage it and how we choose the trade-offs. So that's a very important message for me. 
a big challenge that we have, as there are also opportunities, are the economic development requirements that we must adhere to uh, when we develop our projects. Local content is very difficult. It's very difficult to, to say, okay, I'm going to reach a certain percentage of local content components manufactured in South Africa if the industry has not been sustained for the critical mass and the critical demand to exist uh, for a manufacturing plant to actually be placed in South Africa. So once again, that interplay of the policy uncertainty has seen that kind of uh, challenge that we have to comply to the economic development requirements while simultaneously there's aspects that make that very difficult to adhere to. Job creation is also very difficult. One of the issues is that we don't always in the process have enough time to do the upskilling. So when you create the jobs, you often sit with the problem that during the construction phase, you use a large amount of unskilled workers, which is not ideal because it's not sustainable. And then also on the other side, you also find that it's because of certain educational constraints that it's difficult to find highly skilled workers, even in South Africa, that you need for certain development components. But that is a long discussion in its own right. Then, of course, there's the industry image. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of lobbying going around. There's the landowner expectations. They expect their money tomorrow. They, they now sign this contract for land. Where's my money? I need it sooner. And then there's also the process timelines. I've touched on it a few times. It takes a lot of time to develop a project. People that want the landowner expectations place into that again, they're like, this should have been faster. Why don't I see income generated yet? Communities are asking you, why haven't the promises that you've made been seen in the community yet? It all takes time. And so often we don't have the time and the bidding rounds and when the timing is gonna be right doesn't often align. Big challenges that we need to look at. And then next slide, please. That's me coming to an end. Um, I know I've rushed through it a little bit, but in the middle of the process, I realized that I have a little bit more to say than the time allows. So please feel free to question, ask questions afterwards. Thank you, Jakobus. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to use the Q&A function to um, pose your questions. All of the panelists have agreed to stay on uh, for the Q&A session, so they will address those questions at the end of today's webinar. Uh, so although there are, uh, uh, there are many overlaps between the processes of developing wind and PV projects, there are a number of unique nuances that really matter. Uh, and this is what we should pay attention to. So I'd like to thank Wobus for covering the hard technical and regulatory aspects, as well as the softer aspects uh, and the opportunities within project development. Uh, I think what you would have noticed in both our speakers' presentations is that we have seen them stress on site identification and land acquisition. And therefore, we've decided uh, or we've requested uh, Masha Grimbeck, uh, who is the head of uh, project development at Inetrach, uh, to provide us with a presentation particularly focused on sa uh, site identification and land acquisition. Over to you, Masha. Thank you, Nivesh, and thank you to everyone who's joined this afternoon. I think we can skip to the next slide, please. And in the interest of time, we'll, we'll just dive right in. Um, you can go to the next one. Thank you. So today's session, I'd really want us to focus on these key areas, locality, types of land acquisition, contractual matters, and, and stakeholder engagement. And both my colleagues, Chanda and Jakobus, have stressed to us that we should look at the considerable amount of factors that need to be taken into account during the development of wind and solar. And there's a significant financial investment along a very extended time frame when we compare that to other investment methods. Next slide, please. So if we look at what we touched on earlier, um, we have lots of land in South Africa, but how do we decide what areas we should be focusing on? And as both Jakobus and Chanda mentioned, these are the key factors that we take into consideration. What is the resource availability? How close to grid are we? What is the grid connectivity like? And not just the proximity, but is there capacity? That's important. Um, we look at the overlay of renewable energy development zones and Jakobus has touched on the importance of the just 
to energy transition. And this has focused us as developers to not look at historically what I would call low hanging fruit. We would look, oh, where's the resource the best in, in terms of wind? Oh, it's along the Eastern coast. Where's the re resource the best for solar in the Northern Cape? It's forced us to reevaluate where we are going to uh, acquire land and what still falls within the ideal for development, even though it does not necessarily tick the box for the most optimal um, resource availability. Next slide, please. So what we need to look at in terms of the types of land that we have for renewable energy projects, typically, and the most popular is privately owned land. And this is our typically agricultural land or industrial land. It can also be installed on municipal land and then communal land as well. And we find that these are the main land opportunities for utility scale. And that's important to remember. Chanda mentioned in her slide, um, when you're not doing utility scale, the other options that you have available. Uh, as Jacobus mentioned, we need to look at um, factors such as your cadastral maps. These will tell you at a glance what the land portions are and once we have those cadastral maps outlined, we can then access resources such as your CIPC and Windy that are wonderful tools for you to look at who those landowners can start the engagement process. And I say the term engagement process because it is about relationships and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail. Next slide, please. What is very, very important to consider both of our previous presenters clearly enforced what is required in terms of financing a project and the types of financing we're going to require and not just meeting local requirements, but meeting international finance requirements. Although we have um, an obligation to have local investment and we're increasing on that, all of the fundamental financing regulations are internationally based as well. And what really is important is the lease agreement, because we need to know that if you look at the amount of investment that you're spending over a period of seven to 10 years for a development, you cannot get to a bid stage in the reap round where you've spent millions of rands developing a project and the lease agreement that you have is not suitable. I mean, your Quibus and Chanda mentioned practical things like, is it signed? You know, do, does the wording in the lease agreement, does it comply with what the financial institutions or the lawyers doing your legal due diligence, is it going to comply with those? So recommendation is do your utmost to obtain a lease agreement from reputable legal sources. And we're always trying to find that balance between initial outlay for development but I think one should bear in mind one factor, without land, you have no project and you can lose significant investment if you don't have the right legal access to that land. Ensure that you know what type of party you are contracting with. It's really wonderful. You meet the farmer, you meet the individual that owns the land, it's industrial, you sign your lease agreement and then you take a look later, oh, did this person have the right to sign the contract? Were they empowered to sign the contract? Is there a resolution? Is it a company that I'm trading with? Is it a trust that I'm trading with? Is it an individual? And for each of those, there's this required supporting documentation. So it's fundamentally important that you really identify who the other contracting party is in this. And also remember that because of the length of time that you are engaging with the landowner, sometimes there's a change of ownership. You then need to be able to go back and check that your option to lease, your, your um, material lease agreement, A, allows for that change in ownership, and B, the new owner, do I have all of the required support? Supporting documentation that I can conclude this lease with. If it's a trust, do we have the letter of authority to ensure that the person signing on behalf of the trust is empowered and authorized to conclude that, that transaction? And what might seem insignificant at the time of concluding the lease, because we're all excited that one can access um, this land portion and start development. If you don't 
tick all of those little boxes right in the beginning, it becomes a very expensive exercise and a time pressured exercise when you're in a bid process or trying to achieve financial close on your project. What's also important to remember is that you need to look at the types of um, sorry, servitudes that you'll need. So understanding is also that the Aquibus mentioned you can develop a project in one area, but you need to access the grid. So make sure that not only do you have your option to lease agreement for your main site land, do I have my grid servitude agreements in place? So we, how am I getting to the grid connection? Have I engaged with those landowners? Bearing in mind that those servitudes will be handed over to the system operator, in this case, Eskom. Do I have an access? So my access might be coming over another property. Have I concluded that agreement? Do I have a right of way to cross the property once the site is operational? So sometimes we get caught up in the excitement of wanting to develop a facility and the focus is on the main site land for the development footprint and we forget about the ancillary um, contracts that need to happen to gain lawful access to that land. And think long term, as Chanda mentioned, always keep the end goal in mind. So when you're approaching the contractual side of things, look at what I'm going to need when I have a bid requirement. Look at what you're going to need when you reach financial close. And that seems like something in the very distant future when you're initially engaging with a landowner, with a different stakeholder, if it's communal property but it is worth spending the time analyzing and making sure that you have the correct contractual structure in place, that you have the correct term in place. And like your Kirbis mentioned, you have a 20 year lease. Does that lease agreement comply with requirements of SALA? Is the term correct? If it's a shorter term, what else do I need to have in place? Is the bank going to be happy with that? You know, is there financing on the property? So these are all factors that need to be considered because at the end of the day, there is significant financial investment that is going to happen in order for you to be able to, to bring this project to fruition and to get it properly financed. Next slide, please. I think this slide maybe for me is the most important factor to consider. Jakob has mentioned very, very succinctly, but very importantly, it's people and not companies that we deal with. So what we need to ensure is that we have very good stakeholder relationships. We are not dealing with people over a short period of time. It's seven to 10 years of development, then waiting for a rebrand and hopefully being successful and in going into operations. And that communication is important. It's also a very, very easy way for us to ensure that accurate and relevant information is transferred between the developer and the landowner. There are lots of information that is seen in the national press, various publications, landowners expect a return on the investment in their property. They are giving something that is of utmost importance to them. And I think that is something that sometimes we are not mindful of, that someone is trusting you with something that has been in their family for generations, that has a significant um, cultural sensitivity for them. And now they, you are asking them to trust for them to trust you for the next seven to 10 years. Ensure that you communicate, ensure that the information you, you disseminate to them is accurate and relevant. This also helps to dispel, dispel myths around renewable energy development. You know, often we see, oh, it kills all the birds, you can't farm, so many negatives that exist. We're an industry that has been in this country for 10 years. Um, and we need to dispel the myths around renewable energy de development. It's also very significant when we look at the just energy transition. It's a challenge and an opportunity. And we, we need to ensure that the way we communicate in terms of what will be done with the land, how will renewable energy development take place, that we have factual relevant information disseminated to our stakeholders. Furthermore, it's an opportunity to pass on market developments and to help educate on the benefits of renewable energy. So it's so much more than just 
having a renewable energy facility on your piece of land. It's the positive impacts to community and the country. It's building on what your Kurvis and Chanda mentioned, the socioeconomic benefits, the economic inflows. It's, so, it's much more of a broader positive impact than the potential negative environmental footprint of the installation of the facility. Next slide, please. I think I want to just close off by saying that you know, one needs to be very, very cognizant of when you're approaching land development. Once you've identified that portion of land, be mindful of who and what you're engaging with. Be, in, be careful of the tick box exercise to just say, I have got the land. Ensure that you've got the correct information. And by that I'm saying, make sure that your company name is correct. Make sure that there's not a spelling error in the name of the individual that you're putting down. These might seem insignificant, but when you're in a time pressure scenario, putting a project, trying to get a bank to, to invest at, at financial close, these are the areas that easily trip you up and be, can become a very expensive exercise. That's it for me. Thank you, Navish. Thank you very much, Masha. You've, you've actually very concisely covered the fundamentals of land identification, um, site identification and land acquisition. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I see their hands being raised. Unfortunately, we are unable to take um, live comments. Please can I request that you use the Q&A function uh, to provide us with your questions uh, or the chat function to provide us with any comments. Uh, I'm gonna move on uh, to our next presenter, which is Inga, Inga Golds. Inga Golds. Is the manager, sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> manager of Site Assessment International at GV Renewable Energies. Uh, and she's going to be talking to us about energy resources assessments, uh, wind particularly focused on. Exactly. So many thanks. Um, and also many thanks for listening to all of you. Um, yeah, I think we can just go straight into the presentation. Um, yeah, I think also we can skip the agenda. So um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as Jakob has already mentioned, um, first of all, it's really important to know where um, to find the high, high resource um, areas. So um, for that, we will have a look to the Wind um, Atlas of South Africa, um, which is an in initiative of the South African government. Um, yeah, it's a high resolution wind resource map um, considering 19 metmas with a measurement height of 62 meters. Um, yeah, and this map shows uh, the wind speed at 100 meters, um, so from 2 meters per second in blue up to 10 meters per second in red. And um, yeah, the map gives us already a really good overview about the uh, wind conditions in South Africa, and it helps us a lot to identify um, potential high resource areas. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So um, once a potential site is identified, um, we will have a deeper look into the wind data. Um, so therefore, we download um, 20 years of reanalysis data. So for example, ERA-5 or MERA-2 data. Um, so both sources are available as uh, one hourly data and have a grid resolution of 30 kilometers for ERA-5 and 50 kilometers for MERA-2. Um, so they are also called uh, mesoscale wind data. So um, with this data, we get already um, yeah, the long-term expected wind speed and wind direction condition, um, which helps us to decide if we want to go forward with this project or with the site. Um, so if the wind condition still looks promising and we decide to go forward, um, we will start with a measurement campaign. So, the one or the other <laughs> by wondering why we do measurement campaigns if we have already the long-term wind speed or long-term data. Um, well, the main reason is that um, we need to consider local effects which are caused by hills, 
mountains, forests, or even deserts. Um, so um, placing a mat mast um, helps us, or yeah, with this we receive real on-site measurements and therefore um, we can increase the quality of our plant project um, by reducing the uncertainties and the risks. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So um, how does a wind measurement mast setup looks like? Um, so on the right side, you can see um, a setup drawing from installation report. Um, so a mat mast should consist of several anemometers uh, placed at different heights, also at least of wind, uh, two wind vanes also installed at different heights. Um, yeah, you also can um, measuring um, other components like uh, temperature, pressure, etc. And of course, it should also have a data logger. So the most important thing is um, to set up the mast according to the IC guidelines and to calibrate the anemometers according to the mass net. So um, the IC specifies uh, the correct sector setup of a mat mast. Um, for example, it implements that the boom um, should be orientated uh, depending on the type of mat mast. So for lat lattice mast, um, it's 90 degrees uh, orientation from prevailing wind direction. For tubular mast, it's 45 degrees. Um, furthermore, it, um, yeah, it it describes to um, install a backup anemometer. Usually a backup anemometer is placed like around two meters below the main top anemometer. So um, just in case if the top anemometer fails or shows any malfunction. So we have um, yeah, one anemometer to, to cover the, the lost data. And also um, it says um, that um, we should install at least one other anemometer with a height difference of minimum 20 meters and to be able to um, calculate the shear. Um, the MESNET uh, describes the process of a site assessment. Um, so for example, it covers um, that a minimum measurement height um, of the MET must of at least two thirds of the plant top height should be, should be kept. Also, um, of course, we want to install the mat mast on a representativeness radius, um, which means in simple terrain, the distance between mat mast and um, turbine type can be up to 10 kilometers. In complex terrain, it's only up to two kilometers. Um, also, the measurement campaign should cover at least one year um, so that we cover um, yeah, all the seasonal bias. And in the end, the data availability should be higher than 90%. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so now I just want to give you a short overview um, about UV's wind measurement campaigns. Um, so currently we have measurement campaigns in Germany, Australia, and of course, South Africa. Um, on the left side, um, you can see a yeah, summary of all measurement campaigns which were ever done at UWE all around the world. Um, yeah, as large as share, so here in blue, um, are the met, met must measurements. Um, so yeah, they are most common and um, the acceptable measurements. Um, but for example, in Germany, we changed like three, three, four years ago to LiDAR devices. Uh, this is fully accepted in Germany, which you can see here in gray. Um, so we install already more than 30 um, LiDAR devices. And um, yeah, this will be more in the future, of course. Um, yeah, on the right side, I yeah, I include as well a picture of a LiDAR inside a trailer. <laughs> this is quite common in Germany. It's just for security reasons. Um, 
Yeah, so in South Africa, remote sensing is not yet fully accepted. So therefore, at least up to now, we use um, remote sensing only for prospecting sites. So before we install MET masts. Um, yeah, I also include one picture of a MET mast and um, above you can see a um, picture of a cup anemometer just to get an idea of it. Um, yeah, next slide please. Um, so for data quality um, control, you need to unsure um, yeah, that the quality looks good. So at UWE, we do a daily check of the data receivement, a weekly rough check um, if the data looks plausible, and a quarterly detailed check um, where we look for gaps or any more functions. Um, yeah, therefore we use the software WinPol. So um, below I included a, a screenshot where you can see a few days of a measurement campaign. Um, yeah, so on the top, it's you can see the wind speed and below the, the wind direction. So just to get a, an idea how it looks like. And also, for example, um, here in the wind direction, you can see that one wind vane, the blue one, uh, failed. <laughs> so uh, this is something you try to fill and substitute with, um, with this quality checks. Um, yeah, so after the quality check is done and we have one year or at least one year of data, um, best case, <laughs> we do um, a long term correction. This is an evaluation where the measurement is representative uh, for a long term period. So, um, therefore, the concurrent period of the measurement and the reference data, for example, the error five from error two data, which I explained before, um, is used to determine a relationship between both data sets. Yeah. So, and finally, um, we can start with the wind form layouting or optimization. Um, normally we, we do a preliminary layout before we have all the wind data. Um, yeah, and as uh, Jacobus mentioned it already, we have to consider several points. So the, one of the main point are the environmental conditions and restrictions. So we cannot place the turbines everywhere we want. Um, future more, especially in hilly terrain, we try to place the turbines in a higher elevation to gain more energy. And also we need to consider the main wind direction and the minimum distances. Um, so I am, um, yeah, I have one example here. Oh, can you want go back one? Thanks. <laughs> um, here's one example. So where you can see how important a good layouting is. Um, so considering the, uh, the wind rows, so the main wind direction and therefore also the minimum distances, um, we, we slightly changed the layout. So we, we changed the angle of the turbine row and could gain 2.3% more fuel. So, which is quite a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was really short and quick, <laughs> an overview um, about the wind energy resource assessment. Um, yeah, so many thanks for listening. And if you have questions, just, yeah, let me know. Thank you very much, Inga. Uh, I think that was quite a thorough technical uh, presentation on assessing wind energy uh, resources, especially here in South Africa. I'm going to move on very quickly to the next uh, speaker. I see we're running out of time. Uh, so our next speaker is Doug Tim, uh, and he's also from, um, UV Renewable Energies. He is an expert in yield uh, simulations and technical expert modules. Uh, so Tim is going to talk to us about the um, energy resource assessment of solar PV specifically. Thank you, Nivishan. So um, yeah, I want to start my presentation um, with um, the evaluation of different um, irradiation sources. Um, please one slide back. 
why yeah agenda so um yeah that is the um, main topic or it's it's the essential point for um for the yield um go further with site investigations because not only the irrigation source is um, important it's also the um, surrounding um, and also the soiling study is um, important as well as um, that is quite new the albedo values that means the ground reflection um, of the of the um, yeah, of the site of the ground um, that is important for bifacial modules um, then in my next um, point, I want to go to the PV plant configuration, the requirements that um, came from either the um, from the countries or also restrictions in regards of the grid. Um, then I want to go more in detail to the PV design, and um, I was want to show also some yeah um, especially new topics for the requirement of for modules or not new topics it's um, in general the um, certification of modules and finally then um, an example of a yield yield study and what is already all, all included in, in yield um, studies so next slide please um, yeah, everything is beginning with the with the irradiation of a site, or when you're comparing sites with with, with each other, um, you want in the first step to know how is the irradiation for that for that region or for that site in special, and therefore different kind of sources are available. So, for example, we have um, solar GIS maps. That is the first indication that you know already the global horizontal irradiation (GHI). Um, and um, also um, PVGIS is um, a free source um, to um, have satellite data for a specific site. Um, that's, that both sources are based on yeah, satellite data, whereas MeteorNorm is, um, yeah, um, is uh, evaluation of um, yeah, meteorological stations in the surrounding. When uh, two less stations are um, yeah, in place in your close to your site, then it is also using a share of satellite data compared with um, meteorom stations or only satellite data. In the meantime, there's all the um, yeah, um, meteorom 8 available. So and you um, you see there, you get different kind of relation data. So it's um, really the first input is quite important because it has a high influence on your on your yield study. A typical meteorological year TMY file is um, minimum 10 years um, average um, data, better 15 years. Um, and in the meanwhile, um, yeah, for example, that solar GIS data are available, that satellite data are available for South Africa um, from 1994 up to now with a grid resolution of three till four kilometers. That is um, quite a high resolution for, for satellite data. Okay, next slide, please. As mentioned, it is not only important to have that, um, yeah, that uh, irradiation data, that is uh, the beginning. You need also get an impression of the, of the site. So you must um, know if there are hills around or if you are in a um, yeah, region with mountains, you um, must know if there are far if there are, um, far shading occurs, um, and therefore you get um, that horizontal file that that we can see in the um, right um, picture, um, up in the, on the top. So um, meteorom, for example, also or also solar GIS data allows to get such um, horizontal files when you put in your site coordinates quite accurate accurate. Um, and you see the sun path and um, see if you have a far shading due to hills and mountains. Um, when you have um, quite closer um, shading objects like buildings or trees or something, then it is um, yeah, a good solution to go on the site and um, use devices like, for example, SunEye or there are also some simple devices to get, um, yeah, get an overview of the shading in the surrounding. Um, next important point for energy yield simulations is for sure the soiling 
content. So um, it depends for sure, um, yeah, um, for the, um, with the precipitation and days of, days of rainfall. Um, so when you have really a desert area with really no um, precipitation, it's, um, you can assume a quite soiling loss also for when you have a high traffic region or um, industrial area. Um, or when you build quite close to the sea, it's also often um, a challenge with um, soiling. So that must be all considered for yield um, simulations. And yeah, what is quite new is for sure that albedo values um, coming up with the um, bifacial modules. So in the past, it was not an not a topic with um, with albedo values, but with, with bifacial modules, um, they have that gain from the real side, and therefore it is um, important to know how is your underground. Is it white sand? Is it green grass? Or have your seasonal cha um, um, change, changes of the albedo values? Um, that must all be detected. And here's an example on the right lower part, um, for example, for solar GIS data. Um, with albedo values. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, when you when you want to consider albedo values, you can make short-term measurements. So that is from some third-party institutes available that they go on site for three days till one week. That is um, possible when you have no seasonal shading, uh, seasonal um, changes and you can estimate you have a an, an ground reflection that is always constant and um, together with that um, mobile measurements for short time um, short term you can also quite um, can do also the measurement of the horizon to know the shading um, objects in the sur surrounding um, typical not common is a one year measurement that is um, can be done for solar plants um, that was in the past not really common. So you used always your um, solar GIS data or your, your um, data sources of T TMY files and um, imported that in, in um, yeah, simulation programs like PVSYST. But that is quite new that you can also do um, one year measurements for solar. Um, that is for sure then when you measure there the um, irradiation, it is not relevant for a long term yield assessment, um, but you can compare that with um, satellite data and adjust the long-term satellite data with your measured um, global horizontal iteration. And you can measure, for example, the albedo quite accurate that can be imported then in, in um, simulation programs um, over one year, as well as the soiling degree that you can see on um, um, in that um, picture with two modules, for example, and you see um, you, you keep one module soiled and one module cleaned and um, measure there the soiling effect of the site. Um, yeah, and for the albedo measurement, you see on the right side that um, two parameters, one is facing up, one is facing down to get an impression of that um, albedo value. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, when you do the PV plant configurations, you must first know the whole requirements. Um, gender spoke a lot of that about, about that already. So you need an impression about the available area, about soil conditions. So you must know if you have rocks in the um, on the ground or if you have sand or um, if you have limiting um, obstacles that you must consider overhead lines or like in the picture, you have trees in front of your PV plant or drainage um, areas or um, flooding areas that is, must all be known before you can start your um, PV design. Um, and you have also perhaps electrical restrictions that um, it's only allowed to build up a maximum AC capacity um, that is uh, only allowed to yeah, feed in 75 megawatt, for example, or 10 megawatt is often a ger in Germany a um, limit um, that must be known. And sometimes it's also given a DC-AC ratio that is also quite different in the different countries. So in the US, they use a high DC-AC ratio and put really a lot of modules um, 
two inverters, um, also with the known that in the um, afternoon you have a lot of clipping losses and the inverter limits their power, but they want um, quite in the early in the morning and in, um, in the evening a straight profile. And um, so it's like a rectangle profile that they get at the end, but that is really uh, diff uh, different in the, in the different countries and um, also choose of the, of the EPC. Um, what makes sense. Then also given power factors is um, one topic or the energy demand that you have get a um, profile of the energy demand and you have to build your PV plant as best perhaps also together with battery systems um, to um, yeah, fulfill that energy demand. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, after that, you can start with your PV design. And um, yeah, the first, first topic is for sure, or the first question is um, what kind of system design do you want to use? So is it more on fixed tilt um, system or an east-west tracker system or east-west fixed um, is also possible. East-west fixed is more when you have really a, a quite um, yeah, um, less land uh, available and your site is quite small and you want to pack as much as possible um, or want to install as much, uh, much as possible um, PV power, then an east-west fixed tilt can make sense. Um, east-west tracker is really common in South Africa um, and um, but makes, for example, yeah, not really sense in, in Germany for, um, as it is um, from the irrigation perspective and also from the land perspective, you need more land to um, build really, um, to increase really the capacity. Um, and with, yeah, with that um, comparison of that systems, you must um, yeah, investigate the best yeah, energy output, um, LCOE and um, the POS costs. And um, then you can also start with the module selection. So bifacial is a big topic um, 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 yeah, since I would say last year, beginning last year. Um, yeah, but makes also not um, in all cases sense. So even when the land is limited, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to get a real gain of bifacial modules as you need for bifacial modules, you need a, um, a larger row to row distance. The tables must be not too high. Um, you must build higher above the ground. Um, your your um, ground must be as possible um, yeah, more wide or um, yeah, um, must be not too dark, let's say, um, that increases the bifacial gain. And therefore, it makes not um, for every side sense. Then, um, in the last time, um, there was a big um, improvement in the modules. So, then um, increased a lot um, their cell size from M6 format with 166 millimeter cell sizes to M10 with 182 millimeter and M12. So, we have for that M6 cell size, we have about 410 watt modules. Um, M10 um, um, cell size, it's about um, 550 watt modules and M12 also in that range, 550, 570 watt modules. Um, then for sure to see um, choice of the inverter. Do you want to go with central inverters or string inverters? Um, yeah, it's also a question of maintenance and um, for example, if you are on islands, it makes perhaps more sen sense to build with string inverters instead of central inverters in regards of maintenance. Um, and for sure, also the tracker system or fixed tilt system, you have to investigate if you want to build with a 1P tracker and one module in portrait or two in portrait. Uh, for fixed tilt, the table is getting larger and larger with 2P, 3P. Um, um, yeah, modules, so means um, three modules in portrait um, that are all investigations that should be done. And then you can start with your system design and um, build your modules per string. DC-AC ratio can be considered um, strings per DCP and per racking system, um, the row distances and so on. 
Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is a short digression about requirements for modules. So essential is the, the first um, both IEC certificates. So the IEC 61, 215 and 730 that are essential because they are um, for safety um, qualification and um, type approval. So in that um, IEC standards, the module um, yeah, um, run through several tests in laboratories um, that they must fulfill and um, for safety regulations and um, also for quality um, insurance. And um, then additional IC certificates um, um, we typically request like um, for PID tests, for salt mist corrosion tests, especially when you are building built um, quite close to the sea. Sand blowing test, important for desert areas, ammonia corrosion test. Um, but there are a lot of more IC certificates that um, must be requested, depending also on your on your site sometimes um, and on your yeah, site conditions, let's say. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, and final, um, when you have done all that investigations and estimated your soiling um, losses, estimated your uh, input, your um, aeration data into your energy yield program, um, you can run a simulation or several simulations with different kind of systems. Um, here you see, for example, a, a system also on an hill, you see um, the shading scenery on the left side with the trees and with the to get an impression of the shading of the um, trees and also from the road to road distances. Um, so um, own shading of the tables. Um, and then um, you get at the end a report with the um, yeah all the um, climate conditions. So you have in that report the inserted global horizontal radiation temperatures and the whole um, energy output and for and also the performance ratio of the of your PV plant. Um, you see what you can feed in um, in in the grid. And um, you see as well all the um, losses on the right side that are assumed either with soiling, for example, or that can uh, or are calculated from the program. Um, and that gives at the end the total yield. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, there I'm at the end with my presentation. Thanks a lot for joining. And, yeah. Thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, I think that was extremely important uh, technical considerations both you and Inga have provided uh, for participants who are looking to choose a particular technology. Uh, and it's really the difference between building a um, building a renewable project and building a very successful renewable energy project. Uh, so thank you for that. And I think it was very useful for everyone. Uh, our last presentation today uh, is going to be done by Mike Mangnall who is the Managing Director of WK and Wind Current. Uh, in a segment uh, of the webinar that we call the Developer Spotlight. And this is basically where we um, have developers uh, come and showcase what they've done uh, in their years of existence, how they've developed their, their companies and what kind of opportunities are available for others trying to enter the space. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to you, Mike. Thank you, Navashan, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for the opportunity to participate in this webinar and sponsor this webinar, which I'm finding extremely interesting and very valuable. So, so thanks again, and the chance to just briefly introduce our company, WKN Wind Current, South Africa. Next slide, please. So WKN Wind Current is a subsidiary of a, of a German IPP or independent power producer called WKN. And, and WKN in turn is then fully owned by the PE Group, which is also a German IPP based in northern, northern Germany, just outside Hamburg. And, and we've been part of that group since 2013. The company is a pioneer in the wind, in, in, in the wind energy sector in Europe in particular, and for the last 25 years have, have been uh, developing projects in, 
in this sector. They are leading developer of wind farms in Germany in particular, with over three gigawatts realized of onshore wind projects. They also do operations and maintenance for their own wind farms, as well as other wind farms, primarily in Germany, and have done more than one and a half gigs of those. Um, we have a history of being very successful in offshore wind projects, which is not in South Africa yet, but might be. And we've done eight of those over, over our history. More than five gigawatts of, of projects have been re realized to date. And in terms of investments generated and secured more than 10 billion euros to, to date. Uh, we have an attractive pipeline going forward of in excess of five gigs and have started the development of our first solar PV projects recently. Just briefly, a, a map of, I see our, our locations haven't come up in this particular map, maybe another press of the button, but in essence, we're on three continents, primarily, primarily in Europe, but, but also in the States, in Canada, and then down in South Africa, where we, where we are based, and we have in excess of 400 employees across, across the world. In terms of what we offer, a very experienced business development model, offering and operating across the full, full spectrum, the full range and life cycle of a typical wind farm development from the early days, which has been spoken a lot about today, from the acquiring of the site to, to the analyzing of the wind and the solar, through to through getting in initial offers from turbine providers and I suppose panel providers. And then where a lot of our work sits is around uh, obtaining the, the many, many permits and, and licenses that one needs before you can bid. And then finally, if you're successful, uh, construct and operate your projects. But then in, in Germany, we have a very big financing and sales team, which, which does look at uh, the financial analysis, the competitiveness of a project, as well as its legal basis, which as Mercia outlined is, is, is extremely important. And then, then we, we either hold on to, to our projects or, or sell them on and then arrange project financing for those along the way. We have a, a big and very experienced construction team based primarily in Ger Germany and they've, they've been hard at work at a couple of wind farm sites of late in Poland and Sweden and one recently reached COD. Um, which was close to about 130 megawatt projects. So, so the team is really doing really well. So in essence, we operate as, as an IPP, you know, an independent power producer with very close links to, to the utilities, to infrastructure funds for, for partnering and funding, as well as insurance companies and other IPPs potentially. And then we do have um, a service delivery team which can provide services to both our own wind farms as well as other wind farms. But not only wind farms, we, we, as I said, are looking now at PV and have acquired a number of sites. And as well as the, the, the new hot potato, I guess, is storage and linking those to your wind and or solar farms together with new technologies um, and, and things like power to X, which could be power to gas, liquids, heat, you name it. So, so we, we are considering all, all of those. Next slide, please. So in South Africa, WK and Wind Current, we, we've been around for 10 years. We focus primarily on, on project development, as, as I said, looking at uh, securing land leases, contracting the land, doing the wind measurements and, and doing the analysis ourselves. Together with consultants, you can't do it all yourselves, as has been said before, critically optimizing one's site is throughout the different stages of the development. Which, which is very important to ensure you are competitive along the way. So ultimately you have a product that can, can win during the bid rounds, can financially close successfully, and can then deliver during the construction and importantly, the 20 year operations phase. And, and, and our strength does sit within getting the different planning and uh, environmental approvals and the many others that Jokovis outlined, um, and, and then involved in, in selling these projects as soon as they are ready to to tender. We then support the investor through the bid process if needed, as well as through the financial cl uh, close process. Being part of the PE group, however, does give us an extensive uh, access to in-house expertise. So, so as explained earlier, we have a big project financing team 
we, we have a, a procurement team which has very close relationships to the, to the big turbine suppliers, for example, and, and then we, we, we can execute and, and have done so globally. Also well connected to, to the wind industry globally through uh, so, such as to, to the big uh, turbine suppliers, the big uh, international lenders, the banks, uh, and other technical experts as, as required. In South Africa, we have a, a substantial portfolio of EIA approved wind projects and are currently busy developing and starting the development of a, of a, of a large greenfield pipeline of, of wind and solar projects going forward, which we can then offer for, to, for future tender opportunities, both government, the REAP program at the moment, as well as private offtake opportunities, which is definitely on the, the uptake in, in South Africa. And as I mentioned, we will be also developing a substantial PV pipeline from, from later this, this year. I think there, there might be a slide missing there, Marilise, what's, what's the next slide? Yeah, there, there's a slide missing. If you can just go back one, I, I will um, just talk to what I was, was going to say. But, but basically, we, we are based in Cape Town. We are a small development team, primarily project developers. You can see some of them in the photo on the right there on one of our, of our, one of our site ex excursions. Um, we, but however, we also have an in-house uh, wind and sites expert, as we call them plus two very capable people that are focused on securing land, which was spoken about early, earlier, which is extremely important. And we do have an extensive uh, network of landowners that we keep up to date on a regular basis and, and ensure they, they know where they stand with regards to the progress of the projects and, and when those projects are likely to, to then be su successful. So that, that, that's the core of, of what we, we do. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. And again, thank you. Just the final slide is my, my contact details or my contact details. So please do get in touch if you have any questions. And, and yes, we're open to, to questions and answers and what time's left. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and thank you to the audience who have stayed with us uh, throughout the duration of the session. Uh, we are running a few minutes over. We're going to run a few minutes over. Uh, but without wasting any more time, let me hand over to Ntombi Futun Tuli, who is the CEO at SOWEA, who's going to facilitate the Q&A session. Can I ask for us to take down the presentation, please, colleagues? And can I ask for the speakers to turn on your videos? I hope the network is going to sustain uh, all of our videos, but I think it's just uh, nicer for us to engage uh, with our videos on, please. Over to you, Ntombi. Uh, thank you, Nivashin, uh, and thanks to all our presenters. This has been a very informative and uh, educational uh, episode of our Developing Developer Series, and uh, I'd like to thank our participants as well for um, uh, asking the questions. It means we're paying attention, and uh, judging by the number of participants and the number of questions received, it also means that the presentations were clear enough as I've, I've managed to group uh, the questions show, so I don't think we'll take much time. Um, I'd like to ask the speakers uh, to keep it very brief when answering the questions, just stick to the point, uh, bearing in mind that we are running out of time. Okay, so I've got a um, group of questions um, and there was a lot of questions regarding uh, land related matters. So I would like to just jump straight into those. Uh, I think, uh, most likely for Mesia, Chanda, and Jacobas would be most likely to answer that. Um, the first question is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask these questions in a group because they are very much related so that when you give your, your responses, uh, you are able to uh, uh, combine related matters. Can you build a wind project in a residential area, say a small wind farm? Um, another one asked, what about state-owned land? Uh, what is your take on developing on NGO-owned land in South Africa? How do you structure the lease agreement for communal land? Are lenders willing to fund renewable energy facilities located on communal land? Um, does the proposal of the policy for land expropriation without compensation pose a risk to the development of renewable energy projects? 
And then before I hand over to Nesha, I would, I would like to ask this one. Uh, how do developers, how are developers able to secure land on a, li on a list risk basis pending a preferred bidder award? And I think this question was asked on a, on a basis that um, you, need, you need to access the land to install MetMAS and carry out a required land. How do you deal with landowner expectations? and expectations of compensation during development stage. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll hand over to um, the panelists, uh, just try and address parts of that question and where you are not sure, pass on to the next uh, presenter. Can I start with Alicia? Sure, Tombi, thank you. I think the residential matter is a quick uh, one to answer. Uh, we have to respect buffers and buffers are distances away from residential homes because there is visual impact, there's health and safety impacts, there's shadow flicker impacts, a number of studies that we do. And also we find in a residential environment, the resource might not be sufficient to justify utility scale. And remember, we are talking utility scale, large scale investments here. Um, State-owned land, it's not prohibited. It just means a different level of ne negotiation and you engage with the Department of Public Works and they have a mechanism whereby you enter into a lease agreement with them. Again, also understanding that because of the timeframes in terms of um, the PMFA, you would always lease and not procure. So in terms of state-owned land, it can be done. Um, just means engaging with the Department of Public Works. For communal land, it all comes down to title deed, title deed, title deed. And Jakobus, I'll, I'll hand over to you to go into more detail on this. It's not prohibitive. It just means that you need to have a different level of stakeholder engagement. It is more people focused and to satisfy lender requirements because banks will finance it. But as long as you can prove that the persons who are part of that or say that they are owners of that communal land, that the deed of title is um, associated with that individual. And in terms of land expropriation, it is not a huge risk for renewable energy projects because the lease agreements have the transfer of the right of ownership. So it will move with whomever the owner is. And that extends to option to leases at development phase and also for projects that are under either construction or in operations already. So we have de risk that. And in terms of compensation, it is a conversation that you need. It's that sweet balance of landowner expectation versus the long time frame and understanding that there is a shared risk because we could have delays in the, in the REAP program, which neither the developer anticipates or the owner can expect compensation during a time of no income. So it comes down again to people and not companies having that stakeholder relationship and engagement and balancing the risk reward. And I'll hand over to Yoko Wissam. Thank you, Mersha. I'm gonna go in reverse there from where you ended in terms of that balance with land and expectation. Um, it's a very, very difficult conversation quite often to explain to a landowner that, hey, you know, we're putting in all this risk to develop this land. Um, there's no guarantees. We don't have cash flow yet necessarily. And people are saying to you like, hey, but yeah, you know, I want annual lease fees. Um, so it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation to kick the ball down a curb and say, hey, if you take this risk with me um, at a low cost, then the rewards are going to be so much more later on. Uh, when you can't overcome that, what you often have to do is just to be sure that you, once again, to the point that I made in my presentation, in terms of the financial backing, do you have the financial backing to put in this capital for an uh, indefinite period of time because of the, and the indefinite period of time coming in because of the policy uncertainty and the process? So do you guys see the domino effect? Um, yeah, so if we have more policy certainty, then these answers are going to become a lot easier to answer. And it's going to be a lot easier for you to look a landowner in the eye and say, hey, I don't have the money now, but I can guarantee you that I'm going to have it in five years or in three years. Um, in a perfect utopia, uh, it's a lot easier than saying to them, hey, I don't have the money now. I also don't really know when I will. <laughs> so, yeah. 
that makes it tough. Then coming back to the communal land, I think, Mesha, you, you answered that so succinctly, but just once again, the title deed. What you will find quite often is that on the title deeds of communal land, it doesn't exactly necessarily vest in a trust. There's a lot of land that's governed by the Department of Traditional Affairs and Cooperative Governance, where the land is still marked on the title deed of as the Republic of South Africa. So when you write your contract or when you register your contract, you need to have the owner's consent and now the owner is the Republic. Who do you talk to? What department do you talk to? Where do you take this? Um, that's the one issue that we have. Uh, another issue that you have on communal land is not of, often surveyed very well and very well. Uh, the smaller units you might have, I'm going to take example, the, uh, the Moshe Weng area. It's the old Buputatswana homeland around um, uh, Kuruman and John Tooloha at Sewe. And what you get there is a vast expanse of land, the size of a small European country, but with no, with many tribal councils working and functioning on that one property. So who do you contract with and where does this boundary end? Who gets the money? You have vast communities living onto it. And then last point on that also, if there is a correct detail in terms of what trust the land belongs to, often these trusts comprise of members. That's a whole community. And um, I know it's difficult enough to satisfy 10 landowners uh, on a project development. If a trust comprises of 500 participants, getting all of those people to agree on something becomes so tedious that it's almost impossible um, to, to reach timeframes and timelines. And that mm. often causes for divestment. Thank you, that's all. Uh, thanks, Jacobas. And uh, while you are on that, uh, there's an interesting question that just came in about can uh, landowners sign agreements with um, several developers obviously understanding that not all of them are going to win the projects, basically uh, just <laughs> play a gamble a bit. And then, and then the last one on land, uh, which I think you can also take is, what is the minimum size to be profitable? Uh, are there any ratios or benchmark of megawatt per hectare that one can use? That's actually more difficult to answer than you would think. Uh, but just to, <laughs> just to start on the many developers, I would like to see a development company that would write up a contract in such a way uh, that it will be possible for their competitors uh, to also function on the property. Because what happens in the bidding process quite often is that um, you have a piece of land and you don't necessarily win the project that you have developed that land on in that bidding round, let's say bidding, bidding, bidding round four, then you want to be able to hold on to that asset for the next bidding round, bidding round five. So you don't want to, you don't really want it to be a, you know, a, a free for all for everybody involved. I see a lot of smiles from Mike there. So I think he does exactly what I'm talking about, also from Chanda. Um, and then, yeah, just in terms of the size, a little bit more difficult to answer because of course, my speciality is most certainly in terms of wind. And the problem is you place your turbines where you have the optimal wind resource. So those turbines can be one kilometer apart or those turbines can be 10 kilometers apart and you build roads in between, and you build power lines in between. But a safe assumption, <laughs> Yeah, I have seen I have seen 140 megawatt wind farms that covers in terms of all the properties they involve, well in excess of 3,000. Yes, that's even even that's, I mean, 30,000 hectares. I mean, basically, I've I've seen a project where I don't know if you know Cape Town, but just to orientate yourself, where the southernmost turbine is in Musenberg and the northernmost turbine is in Atlantis, just in terms of distant scale. But if you took the actual infrastructure footprint, I think a safe assumption is almost to say, which I usually work with, is about 150 hectares per 140 megawatts. So it's almost a one-to-one -one relationship. But then I'm saying, you only meet, take the you only take the foundation and you only measure the road and you only measure the cable, uh, so it's uh, not an easy answer. And yeah. I think Chanda would be better to answer in terms of the PV area that we need. So maybe uh, okay. again, I'd look at it slightly differently in terms of if your question is to know whether a project is going to be feasible from an investment point of view, you need to understand who's lending you the money and how much they want back on it. So what your interest rates are going to be. So you have to work all of these things in and what are your costs of 
if it's the wind, if, uh, what are your costs of your turbines, what are the costs of all of your inputs, and then what do you have left to understand then the, the feasibility, and that's what you do in the whole feasibility study, the feasibility of your solar plant or your wind farm, so it's not necessarily just a ratio of air of space um, it takes from we had all that whole list of things that you have to take into consideration those all feed into your financial model and then spit out a value as to whether it's going to be worthwhile for someone to lend you the money to build the project and you will be able to um, have a viable uh, viable return on that investment it's, and it's very long-winded way of saying it's a very difficult question <laughs> to answer <laughs> let's let, let's leave it there chanda i think you guys gave it the best shot um, maybe um, moving on to the grid connection questions, um, there was a question about distance for location of uh, solar or wind energy facilities nearest to the grid connection point, but thanks to Rian Smith, he's answered that on chat, and I'm going to ask the next question, who pays for the grid connection infrastructure, uh, like, like power lines and substations? Is it ESCOM, municipality, IPP developers? I think um, Jacob has answered this in his presentation. You pay it yourself, and um, if I heard correctly, uh, you transfer to ESCOM. But I think us differently would be, do IPPs get compensated for building this infrastructure? Can we take that one, Jacobas? So, okay, so basically, I'm, I can only speak for how we usually do it. Uh, so first and foremost, you would, ideal would be to go in where there's no, not a lot of upgrading needed, but wherever you need to build lines. So you have a distribution line, if you build your own substation for the project, and you have to build a distribution line, that's 132 kV and upwards. Uh, 132 kV, you need a distribution license. Generally, IPPs do not get in distribution license. So what happens is if you build, ESCOM wouldn't necessarily have um, have the capacity to build a line or want to build a line. So they will give you a cost estimate letter. So, and then what is going to cost for them to do their monopoly works that only they can do. So you pay the money to them. And then you add with that to the infrastructure you have to build yourself. And then you transfer everything beyond the IPP switch yard um, from your grid, you transfer to ESCOM. So that often when you, I said something about grid connection where you have servitude, where you go over people's lands, those servitudes also goes towards ESCOM. Uh, it does not remain with the IPP. Those are not land rights or, or and infrastructure that we keep for mm -hmm. ourselves. So it's a cost to the IPP, but it's an asset to the country. Okay. Uh, no, thanks. Thanks for that. That was nice and precise. Um, and then with regards to um, economic development, uh, somebody asked why did government approve the rates, renewable energy development zones? Does this not exacerbate uh, inequality with regards to expected socioeconomic benefits associated with renewables? Um, <clears throat> So that's one question. The other question related to economic development um, for both solar and wind specialists, DTI local content requirements is in many instances onerous to developers. Expensive technical equipment cannot be sourced locally and impacts on local content spend as a percentage of CAPEX. Is there an, a specific database of local content suppliers for wind and solar equipment? And are there in addition any specific technical equipment that is excluded? from the local content requirements. Um, I think, um, yeah, was it Jacob has touched on this? Yeah, okay, lots of questions for me today. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, on the local content, uh, this is it's a very good question. There's not one database uh, mm -hmm. where you get your local content suppliers. Um, now, in terms of renewable energy, there's a finite amount of suppliers that can supply you with the key equipment. Now, key equipment is often listed as certain. Hours. That's your solar panels, that's your PV panels, that's your turbines, your nacelles, your towers, um, your inverters, all of that and more. I mean, I'm just brushing mm. on top of it. So there's a lot of suppliers. So at the end of the day, your EPC contractor, if it's not yourself, is going to look at um, cast the net far and wide and go do some market research uh, it, yourself. So I think it is on the IPP yourself to do market research. And that's also those relationships that you build. And that remains market intel. So if you're going to go around and say, yeah, you know, I've got a list of... <laughs> I've got a list of suppliers out there that's and 
it, everybody's going to compete for the attention of the same suppliers because let's take wind turbines for instance there's a finite amount of wind turbine suppliers out there there's a lot of people that want to bid and uh, a lot of people want to use ha gain the assurances that they're going to have that that wind turbine supplier to put them first in line when manufacturing starts and that comes with certain so mm -hmm. there's always a race on that so it's not just one finite list what i well then what I well and truly can say is if I've now called a few suppliers, for instance, for PV panels, and I see that, shucks, I can't find anybody that can reach my local content threshold, then you call the DTIC. Mm. And they're very helpful. And there will be a person there that will tell you, okay, who have you called? Who have you spoken to? Have you tried this and this and this? And those people, they and they will point you in the right direction. But there's not, to, as far as I'm aware, an active database in place uh, can, right. can, can you just the, the first question it okay the first question lift is the brain fine. Up. i'd like mike to touch on that as a developer um uh, on on the reds why uh, the question is why did government approve uh, the renewable energy development zones uh, is it not uh, going to disadvantage uh, other communities in terms of expected socioeconomic benefits yeah, big, big question. Um, I, I think that the main reason government developed them and is still continuing to, to update them on a regular basis is, is to try to be strategic about where wind farms and solar farms happen in the country. You know, many have happened, but there's still many more to come. So are they being located in the best possible positions, locations when you look at a whole range of factors, including technical, environmental, but also socioeconomic. And I know that those factors have been taken into consideration. There is a criteria around how sort of impoverished certain areas are. Uh, and then mm. the, the, the poorer those areas are, they are given certain uh, higher scores. And therefore you are supposedly drawn, supposed to be drawn towards those areas. But it does take you know, a whole mix of factors when deciding on where to, to locate. Um, and, and, and I think no one will be disadvantaged. A, a, a site will always be, be developed where we're most suitable from all aspects and where ultimately it can be financially um, successful, constructed and then operated. And, and I think most importantly, it's environmental considerations of those areas that are being assessed. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm going to want to close now because we are uh, running out of time uh, with just two questions, one for Inga and one for Dirk. Uh, resource assessment, uh, wind, must wind um, measurements be conducted every 10 kilometers on a wind farm? Uh, how long does the process of wind assessment take and why is LIDAR not acceptable in measuring wind resources in South Africa? That's for Inga. Okay. And then for Dirk, uh, what do I absolutely need for the resource assessment testing for a solar PV farm? Um, so the 10 kilometers in simple terrain is a recommendation of the MassNet. Um, I mean, if possible, of course, <laughs> you should do it, um, but um, energy assessment is always related to uncertainty assessment. So in case that um, it's not possible to install for, for any reason, um, you just need to increase the uncertainties. Um, so it's a matter yeah, of conversation and um, yeah, it depends really okay. on the side as well. Um, the Soran LiDAR device, um, I was referring to the reprogram. Um, I think it's still in discussion if it will be accepted or not. Um, so, um, especially uh, um, like, um, um, how to say, like only measurements, uh, only remote sensing measurements um, might be a problem. Um, but yeah, let's see, I, I cannot yeah, explain why. <laughs> so also, um, I think it's a matter of uh, yeah. also turbulence assessment. So yeah, and reliability. Um, What's, what's the third question? Sorry. <laughs> mm. Okay, I'll tell you now. The third question, why is LIDAR not acceptable in measuring wind resources? Yeah, I, this, this I said. So it's not, I cannot really comment on it. it really, 
um, yeah, it's a REAP um, decision. And Maybe can I can I jump in on that? Yeah, one? sure, of course. I think when the when the REAP was designed, um, the IPP office and the uh, advisors were trying to minimize the risk. Um, as far as the tender process is concerned. So you'll see that a lot of the requirements that were in the round one, they um, lessened as you went through the rounds, but you had to have certification for the turbines, you had to have certain um, track record um, and things like that. And so it was basically so that the projects were guaranteed to perform. And as far as IPP office were concerned, the gold standard was a met mast at two thirds of hub height. Um, and so at the time when they did it, which you have to remember was a long time ago, right? It was 2009, 2010 that they first designed it. Um, LIDAR and SODAR weren't so widely accepted. And so we don't know what, you know, in the upcoming rounds it might change, but you are, uh, you, you know, that doesn't stop you as a developer from using that technology to do correlations, but you still have to have the met mast just because that was the best practice internationally at the time. Mm. Okay, thanks, Chanda. And uh, last one for Dirk, mm -hmm. uh, you got the question. Yeah, so absolutely yeah. necessary is, is, is really the irrigation data to get an um, um, exact file. So uh, measurements are not really necessary in the beginning, let's say, especially when you Built with monofacial modules, it is um, uh, the albedo value is not um, necessary, and um, even when you build with bifacial modules, um, you can estimate the albedo value out of yeah, let's say tables. To to there are some pictures to estimate the underground and the reflections um, that you can put in your um, yeah, yield study um, to get that albedo values. And, um, but the most important thing is really to, to have that um, TMY file um, from a good solar source, um, you know, like satellite data or you know, from a MET station. All right, uh, thank you. I think uh, we, I'm going to stop it here with the questions. I have captured all the questions from the Q&A function and uh, in the chat. And we, we are going to uh, send some of the unanswered questions to the panelists and hopefully be able to get back to participants with answers for those questions. Uh, so at this point, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for dedicating your time uh, to educating South Africa about the renewable energy industry. It's very important. And as I've always said before, uh, there are people who are looking into the industry and wondering where do I start, where do I go for information and who can assist me. So the information that was shared today was very important and um, we, we thank you for that. Um, I would like to thank also our um, partners, the IPP office, uh, the Renewable Energy Forum of South, uh, Entrepreneurs Forum of South Africa and uh, Black Energy Professionals um, association uh, for supporting us in putting together this um, capacity building initiative. Um, and then most importantly, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsor for this particular uh, webinar today, uh, WKN Current, uh, you've heard from, um, you've heard from uh, Mike and uh, we really appreciate uh, your participation and actually showing that developers um, can uh, educate and support aspiring developers in the renewable energy space. And then lastly, I would like to thank our series sponsors, uh, Mainstream Renewable Power and Juvi for uh, the support uh, and provi providing us with experts to come and present in this, uh, in this uh, different uh, webinars that we've always had. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to say thank you very much. And most importantly to our team, the Sawaya and Sapia team for all the hard work that goes into putting together this kind of uh, online events. Um, and then thank you all the participants for dialing in. Uh, I think at most we reached about 300 number of participants. It also shows that uh, this is a very important um, initiative that uh, South Africa would like to learn more from the renewable energy industry. So I think I've said enough. Uh, thank you very much for dialing in and have a good day. Thank you.
Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm extremely grateful for the amount of detail that you guys have provided in your presentations, and I'm very grateful for that. So thank